This video is sponsored by Wondrium. Many misconceptions surround the pre-contact people of the Americas. One that I had personally believed up until relatively recently is that the Native Americans did not use metal. I have since learned that metal was actually used in many areas of the Americas. The Great Lakes region in particular was home to a flourishing copper working culture for thousands of years. The Old Copper Complex, or Old Copper Culture, is an archaeological culture from the archaic period of North America's Great Lakes region. Artifacts made of copper were first produced by these people as far back as 9,500 years ago. This evidence comes in the form of quarries. The oldest reliably dated artifact is a projectile dating to 8,500 years ago from Wisconsin. This is a very ancient date and rivals the oldest evidence of copper use in the world. The oldest worked copper ever discovered dated to over 10,000 years old and was found in northern Iraq. It would take some time to be utilized throughout much of the old world. The copper age did not begin in Europe until around 7,000 years ago. Ironically, Native Americans of the old copper culture were extensively using copper possibly over a thousand years before the Europeans. However, a major difference between the copper use in the Americas and Europe is smelting. In Europe and much of the rest of the world, copper deposits are not pure and must be smelted. In the Great Lakes region, 99% pure copper can be found at the surface. This copper does not require smelting to be used. The archaeological evidence of smelting in the Americas is subject to dispute. But to date, no evidence of copper casting has been found in prehistoric eastern North America. Casting was used in other places in the Americas, but probably not during the old copper culture. The objects were instead mainly cold worked into shape using hammer stones. This may sound very difficult, though copper is quite soft and you would be surprised how easy it is to shape. Evidence suggests that copper was also annealed, which made it easier to work with. The complexity of their artifacts indicates a high degree of technological specialization. Copper nuggets were likely first found in deposits from glacial drift throughout the Midwest. Later, as the technology began to be utilized more often, copper was quarried from various places in the Great Lakes region. Deposits spanning 120 miles along the southern shore of Lake Superior were the primary source of copper for these people. Other areas have mines as well, such as Isle Royale, which has over a thousand in itself. These pits were much more numerous than once thought. The total amount of copper extracted by the old copper culture is estimated to be as much as 1.5 billion pounds. Extracting the copper ore was accomplished with the use of hammer stones. These stones were pounded into the rock surrounding the copper to extract it. Heat was also applied to the rock which was then doused in water. This could cause the rock to shatter or weaken significantly. Extracting copper would have been hard work and the number of sites known says something about the capabilities of these people. Copper was extracted in a rough shape though since it was as much as 99% pure copper, it could be processed simply by pounding. The rough chunks of copper were broken into nuggets, which were then hammered into small bars. These bars could be used to create a variety of tools. The introduction of copper into their toolkit revolutionized their technology to some degree. Before the development of this technology, stone was the main form of tool used for cutting purposes. Good napping stone is not very abundant in the Great Lakes region. Flint is available in some places and these people certainly did make great technology with stone. Though copper has a number of properties that made it more or less superior to stone. It is not the strongest metal, but it can be reshaped and resharpened with ease. Stone projectile points are usually only good for a couple of hunts depending on the way it was made and what it hit but a copper projectile point could easily be used dozens of times. By far the biggest advantage of copper is its ability to be shaped in ways that stone cannot. Copper can be made much skinnier without sacrificing as much structural integrity. 
The old copper culture made copper into fishing hooks, needles, awls, and other shapes which would be very hard or nearly impossible to make with stone. Fishing hooks were certainly useful in the Great Lakes region. Hooks can be made of organic materials such as wood or bone, but they are harder to make and generally perform worse. Harpoons and other fish spearing devices were also made with copper. Needles could certainly be made of bone, though they take a long time to make and are prone to breaking. The copper culture still used stone for a variety of things, and copper is actually a great material to work it with. Many modern-day flint knappers, such as myself, primarily rely on copper tools. It is particularly useful for pressure flaking. Antler also works well, though it must be resharpened often. Another advantage of copper tools is how thin they can be made. Stone can be made very thin, however, it takes considerable skill. Thin copper is also much more durable than thin stone. Due to these properties, the natives were able to make many wider tools such as knives, cleavers, spear points, and crescent-shaped knives. The variety of knife designs indicates that they are being made for specific purposes. Some appear to be made for chopping up food, others for cutting wood, and some look to be more general hunting knives. The handles of these knives have long since decayed, though it can be assumed they are made of wood, antler, or bone. Some knives used a unique hafting method that I have not seen anywhere else, which involved sandwiching a handle between the copper. Interesting crescent-shaped knives similar to Ulu knives are quite common and appear to have been used for cutting up food or for butchering animals. Let's take a break from the video to talk about today's sponsor, Wondram. You may be familiar with The Great Courses Plus. Well, the people who created it have made big moves to create a bigger, broader, and better educational experience which we now call Wondrium. Wondrium is a platform to learn about everything you have ever wondered about. They have a vast collection of videos, tutorials, how-tos, and documentaries. All of their content is academically comprehensive, thoroughly researched, and endlessly entertaining. Wondrium has such a wide array of content, and I can sincerely say I have watched many hours of it. I am currently very interested in the ancient Mediterranean and the Italian language. They have content about ancient battles, religion, architecture, and my personal favorite, a series about Alexander the Great. From this series, I learned that he named over 70 cities about himself, and even one about his horse. To satisfy my language learning needs, Wondrium even has a whole series for learning Italian. I will be studying abroad there in only a few months, and this show is helping me a lot. They have content that can help you learn a variety of languages, including French, Spanish, Greek, and even classical Latin. I'm always looking to continue to learn about new topics and grow in new ways, and Wondrium makes it so easy by continuing to add content to their platform every month. If you've ever wondered about anything, Wondrium will be your new favorite place, and they're giving viewers a great offer of a free trial. Show your support for my show by subscribing. Huge thanks to Wondrium for sponsoring the channel, and now let's get back to the video. A variety of spearheads and smaller projectile points were produced. Some of these larger points are quite impressive and must have been mounted on large thrusting spears. Smaller projectiles were likely used as atlatl darts. Atlatls were widespread throughout the Americas during the Paleo-Indian and the Archaic period, and the Great Copper Culture almost certainly used them. Points were often made by pounding copper into a thin sheet. This sheet was then folded into a cone. These points were used for the entirety of the existence of the Copper Culture, meaning they must have been efficient hunting points. Modern recreations have shown that they were deadly and durable, even when thrown against hard surfaces. Some of these points were smaller than others, and some have suggested that they may have been arrowheads. Bow technology did not reach the Midwest until 1500 years ago, though this date is debated. It is unlikely that this culture was using the bow over a thousand years before our evidence suggests. Small conical points are likely just smaller than usual atlatl points. 
It is interesting to me to think about hunters with copper-tipped atlatl points and long copper knives. It almost seems like they skipped a step, though I think that is just ethnocentrism at play. Copper was also a very useful material for woodworking. Stone can be used but is generally less effective and certainly takes many more hours to make. The celts could have been used to fill large trees which would then be hollowed out into a canoe with the help of an adze. These canoes were used for fishing with nets, hooks, and spears. Other objects made of copper include various other tools, beads, rings, and other ornamental objects. The old copper culture existed during the Archaic period. Prehistoric America is divided between the Paleo-Indian, Archaic, and Woodland periods. Some include the Mississippian as well. People from the Paleo-Indian period were highly nomadic, specialized hunters that relied on relatively few plant and animal resources. Cultures from the Archaic period began to use much more resources in their environments and lived in larger groups. Many of these populations were also sedentary for part of the year. The people of the old copper culture stayed at base camps either annually or seasonally. Other sites include their hunting or collecting camps, and of course their quarry sites. These people were not necessarily part of a single homogenous state or society. They were rather many interconnected populations with a similar culture. Since these people lived in a copper-rich area, copper was traded around much of North America. The social hierarchy of these archaic copper groups is poorly understood, but copper was certainly an important symbolic good. We know this from many burial sites containing copper tools. The frequency of symbolic copper objects increases as time went by in the Great Lakes regions. Around 3500 years ago, copper tools began to become much rarer while personal ornaments made of copper appear at a higher frequency. By the start of the woodland period around 3,000 years ago, copper tools become very scarce and most tools were once again made out of stone. It may be baffling to you that after I just described how great copper was that these people eventually more or less stopped using it for tools. Though this has to do with the culture and society of the period. In the early archaic, many populations were quite small and consisted mainly of family groups. These groups lacked significant power structures and were egalitarian in nature. As the archaic went on, group sizes increased and with it appeared new social organizations. Powerful elites needed a way to distinguish themselves from the commoners and copper was a way to do it. Copper was already a valuable material and it could be made very beautiful once polished. Elites decorated themselves with ornaments of all kinds and perhaps deliberately forbid commoners from using it for tools. Though tools were still made, so this is unlikely. With the increase in population size, competition between groups meant there was less food to go around. The Great Lakes region also happened to be drying out during this time period which reduced the number of food resources. Both of these factors meant that more time was spent hunting and gathering. Quarrying and working copper took a vast amount of time and effort, and it was even more expensive for groups not near copper. Another important factor is the actual coppersmiths. Why make a hundred arrowheads and axes for commoners when you could get paid more to make jewelry for the elite? As paid more I don't necessarily mean with money, but certainly with goods and status. As for the commoners, why acquire expensive copper when stone could do the job nearly as well? Stone was available, cheap, and didn't take long to work. A stone point can be made in less than 20 minutes by an experienced napper. The introduction of the bow and arrow also meant that projectiles got smaller. Small stone points are quite easy to manufacture and many can be made from a relatively small quantity of stone. Stone is poor in the Great Lakes region, but the formation of long-distance trade networks made quality stone available in the region. These arrowheads of quality material performed about as well as copper ones. Quality stone essentially became cheaper to these people, and the performance benefits of copper did not justify the extra cost. 
Metal seems more advanced from our perspective, but these people were not thinking about slow technological progression. They were thinking about their day-to-day -day lives. Some copper tools continued to be created, though to an insignificant level. As the years went by, copper remained a material to be used for ornamental purposes in the Great Lakes region. In other areas of North America, copper was used, though still mainly for jewelry and other objects for the elite. Of course, the Europeans would arrive and, with them, the widespread availability of various metals. However, the legacy of this technology would live on. The old copper culture made very fascinating technology and is truly unique in the Americas and the rest of the world. What culture or technology would you want me to cover next? It could be from the Americas or Eurasia or really anywhere. Leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching this episode of Northode 2. Arrivederci.